Roddy, thank you very much indeed, and uh, delighted to be here this afternoon. I must say, I wasn't quite certain what shape this would take, this meeting. It's my first time in this church. Uh, not my first time in Ludlow, of course, but my first time in this church, and I suspect that it's the first time I've had an opportunity to talk about Mortimer Forest and why Mortimer Forest is of such huge importance in the national scene. And if it's of importance in the national scene, obviously, it means it's important globally. But what I do want to do today is to make the connection between some of these big global issues and what we as citizens do in our own backyards, in our own communities. Because sometimes it's that set of connections which it's hard to really understand the true importance of. And I was really thinking about that coming up on the train uh, today. I live in Cheltenham in Gloucestershire, not that far away. It seems like it's a very long way away when you come by train <laughs> because <clears throat> obviously it's not a completely direct route and I enjoyed finding myself in South Wales first uh, on my way up here to Ludlow. Um, and as you come n north through Wales and then into Herefordshire and you're looking out the train window and everything is green and verdant still, end of summer, but still looking amazing. And you think, well, this is all right. We know that this is a green and pleasant land. We love the idea that the UK as a whole, particularly special parts of it, are so important to us from a conservation of biodiversity point of view. But many of you will know that although you might be looking out onto great stretches of land that are green, it doesn't actually mean they are biologically diverse. It doesn't mean to say that they are as vibrant and productive and resilient to the changes that all parts of the UK are suffering from already. It doesn't mean that we've got the integrity of the natural world in these places that we should have. And in fact, I was reminded about this just last week when I was uh, reading one of the many reports that comes into my inbox on my iPad, and I feel duty-bound to read an awful lot of this stuff, but I was reminded of something recently that was really quite a reminder of just how bad things have got here in the UK. I'm not going to call it a green desert, quite, the UK, because we're not there yet. But there is an index called the Biodiversity Intactness Index, which is supported by the UN, and it does this survey every year of every country. And what it's doing is measuring what percentage of the original biodiversity of a particular country is still intact today. So it looks at 240 different countries. The UK comes 218 out of 240 countries in terms of loss of intact biodiversity. That's bad enough. We're also still going down. So going in the wrong direction, already 218 out of 240, which makes our green and pleasant land, whatever it may look like, one of the most nature-depleted countries in the world. It's hard to get our minds around that when you think about it, because we are accustomed to seeing this as a particularly beautiful set of interlocking landscapes. And we automatically assume that means that they are as healthy and vibrant as we would like them to be. But unfortunately, they are not. And the consequence of that is we now need to be infinitely more vigilant about what happens to what is left of our intact biodiversity and what we need to do to restore our depleted biodiversity than we have ever been in the past. And again, I was struck by, a, as I was coming up here today, I was struck by an article that I was reading by an old colleague of mine 
a, a wonderful, very inspiring uh, environmentalist called Mark Carwardine, who has done a lot of work for WWF and other organizations. And I was looking at an article of his in uh, BBC Wildlife, and he was looking at this whole question about why it is that this state of affairs seems to have crept up on us so that we appear in such a shamefully low position in an index of that kind. And this is what he concludes. Wildlife and conservation charities in the UK have just been too soft. Too soft by far. Yet the building, development, farming, fishing, and shooting industries have been able to play hardball for decades, prepared to do whatever it takes to get whatever they want through the system. And I would suggest that through an unhappy mix of gullibility, laziness, appeasement, scientific ignorance, and political greed, successive governments have played along with these development interests in order to meet their expectations. That's quite a harsh uh, judgment, but he wrote this article because he'd read in the RSPBs, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, he'd read in their latest newsletter, a rather chilling editorial from the director of that organization, which had come to the conclusion, we failed Nature is closing down. Quite a dramatic way of capturing the notion of what it is to be the 218th most nature-depleted country in the world. Now, there's a lot of evidence behind this. As you can imagine, these are not just statistics that are plucked out of the air. These are cumulative, research-based investigations that have been going on for a long time and well understood in the political system of which we're all a part. The Environmental Audit Committee, which is the sort of watchdog cross-party committee in the House of Commons, recently produced a report on all of this and looked at the degree to which government today is capable of doing what is needed to protect our natural spaces, both those that are designated as special places, sites of special scientific interest, areas of outstanding natural beauty, national parks, etc., etc., and those that we just live cheek by jowl with, not special in any designated sense, but special to a lot of us where we live locally. And this report from the Environmental Audit Committee was <laughs> a damning is slightly inadequate adjective to capture their judgment of government's cumulative efforts, describing the total resource available to government through government bodies themselves, government agencies such as the Environment Agency and so on, describing this whole apparatus of regulation and control as wholly inadequate. It's quite astonishing to think that at this stage, in the 21st century, we, as taxpayers in this country, are still seeing more of our money devoted to destroying nature than to protecting it. Far more. Far more. And the Environmental Audit Committee breaks this down in some detail, as you can imagine. Now, don't get me wrong on this. I am not making some possibly uncomfortable party political statement here. It so happens that the Environmental Audit Committee was looking back at the last 10 years of this government, or the first, the coalition government from 2010 to 2015, and then the Conservative government through from 2015 onwards. But I can remember reports of an equally critical nature being written about the predecessor government, about the Labour Party when it was in government. And you can track this back pretty much as far as you want to go when we begin to think of the cumulative destruction of the natural world in this way. And one of the problems, of course, is that we've never really 
seen this as a critical function of our state, of government. DEFRA, the department now, previously Department of the Environment, is always seen as a pretty unimportant little department. You don't normally get politicians who are on the way up taking over as Secretary of State in DEFRA rather than on the way down. And even when you do, and they shine brightly in DEFRA for brief moments, that aura doesn't last for very long. And I offer you, by way of contrast here, a certain David Miliband, who was Secretary of State at DEFRA for a short but very shiny period of time during the Labour government, and of course, a certain Michael Gove, who was also very shiny as Secretary of State at DEFRA. Both of those politicians at that stage in their careers were on their way up, as an exception to the rule I offer you. Neither of them had any impact whatsoever on the relative weight attached to how we look after the natural environment here in the UK. Neither of them. Both in their own way, exceptionally talented politicians, one of whom Day is at least still doing a useful job. I will leave it to you to work out which. <clears throat> but this tells us something about Mark Carbidon's judgment that we've let politicians get away with this continual downgrading of anything to do with the natural world, anything to do with the environment, to the point now where it's very difficult to bring that back right into the heart of decision-making processes and of politics today. Very difficult to see how you'd actually uh, do it. And I could be quite mean, for instance, and ask for a show of hands as to those people in this church today who can actually name the Secretary of State at DEFRA, because very often that is a moment of deep embarrassment whenever one addresses an audience such as this. When those politicians are there, what they love to do is to distract people's attention from the fierce and sharp controversies associated with protecting the environment by pitching the period of time that they're inviting us to think about as far out into the future as is possible. So Michael Gove, when he was Secretary of State, was deemed to have achieved an extraordinary success as far as his civil servants were concerned by coming up with something called the 25-year environment plan. Because anything that is out there for 25 years or even more through to 2040 to 2050, and I'll come back to target setting as a measure of relative political failure. Anything that is out there in the future means we automatically start discounting its importance to people today. Since that 25-year environment plan came into being, no progress, I do mean no, according to the Environmental Audit Committee, no progress has been made in putting in place those decisions which are necessary to deliver the commitments made in the 25-year environment plan, because that's all short-term, that's right now. Those are things that have to be dealt with in this period of government, within this budget, facing all of these particular issues and challenges that we face today. And we know those issues and challenges today are really overwhelming. I mean, I don't, must be careful not to be too harsh on our politicians today because we are facing so many difficulties. But if you compare something like the 25-year environment bill, which reads beautifully, by the way, as an ex-English teacher, I was always quick to acknowledge Michael Gove's facility with the English language. 
If you compare that with two bills going through Parliament right now, the Environment Bill and the Planning Bill, you can absolutely guarantee that the 25-year Environment Plan has nothing in it which can withstand the consequences of those two real-time new bills stroke acts going through Parliament right now, particularly the planning bill, and I'm sure many of you are as concerned about that as I am. Now, what lies, what lies behind this? Let's just juggle with this paradox for a moment. You probably know that here in the UK, we have a greater percentage of individual citizens who belong to environment and conservation organizations than any other country in the world. So 218 out of 240 when it comes to nature depletion, number one in the world when it comes to numbers of people who belong to organizations that ostensibly are there to protect nature, precisely the thing that is clearly not working out quite as well as we might hope. There's a hell of a gap, sorry, there's a big gap between number one in the world on membership of environmental conservation organizations and 218 down here. What is going on? Is Mark right? Is it just that we're a bunch of softies? That we don't really understand the true nature of the kind of battle that we've been involved in for decades and which is certainly not coming to an end anytime soon. We've just not got our heads around the ruthlessness with which economic developers will bring their plans to bear on a particular area, even if that part of the environment, that part of the natural world, has to be written off as collateral damage. Now, you'll be happy to know I'm only going to be banging on this afternoon for a roughly half an hour, so I'm at least halfway through. I'm not going to have a chance to talk about why it is that our obsession with economic growth and anything that can promise to achieve a little bit more economic growth will always take precedence over anything that seeks to protect the natural capital on which that growth is based, always, almost without exception. I'm not going to be able to do the full story about that this afternoon. But this obsessive drive to achieve growth at all costs is still at the heart of why we are finding this so difficult. I first got involved through Roddy talking about Mortimer Forest when a development proposal that seemed to an awful lot of you and to all of the friends of Mortimer Forest was brought forward that seemed to be classically insensitive and going for the kind of trade-off which would normally be taken for granted in any economic planning decision of that kind. And as I've witnessed these proposals coming forward in place after place after place, time after time after time, and <laughs> please, let's remember that no sooner do you win one short-term victory of that kind than the developers, whoever they are, whether they're private sector developers or developers who've got an interest with, to use public money, will come bouncing right back again with another development that may have just been tweaked at the margins, may make it a little bit greener, a little bit more acceptable to people along the way, but basically it's still got that same inherently destructive trade-off at its heart. That the damage that we do to the natural environment here is an acceptable price to pay for another chunk of economic progress. And it was that that got me thinking about and learning about Mortimer Forest, as I was clear to your friends here, I didn't know very much about Mortimer Forest at that point. And like so many people who see these things from afar, I needed to get my head around what was happening here and gradually found out more and more and discovered, of course, that this was one of those places where what you've just heard about during that film needs to be put right out there all the time 
as an absolutely critical part of what people locally in this area, in the marches, do to, to protect Mortimer Forest. We can do those things locally. We can do those things locally because these places live in our hearts. They're not just intellectual abstractions. They live in our hearts because they're places that we know and come to love and cherish. And it is very, very hard in today's world to protect that which we do not love. It's very difficult to do that. So these connections, deep connections, sometimes very long-lived historical connections, visceral linkages, are a critical part of what makes local campaigning so important. And that was what I wanted to just mention today, because we have to get the local right if we're to have any chance whatsoever of sorting out these massive global issues, whether it's global biodiversity collapse or climate change or the buildup of plastics in the ocean, whatever it might be, we have to be able to sort this out locally. And courtesy of my lovely uh, three hour and 15 minute train journey today, I had an enlightening and amazing time reading up on two just tiny things I'm just gonna mention because I do have the other half of my inbox filled with truly <laughs> inspirational stories about people and communities making sense of these challenges. And the first goes to a little initiative called Incredible Edible, and I knew I was coming to Ludlow today, and I know the food festival is going on all like that. Not sure whether Ludlow is an incredible edible town, probably. I know anything to do with food, obviously, is pretty important. So Ludlow, I'm getting a few heads. You're an incredible edible town, wonderful, okay. So I first met the originator of the incredible edible idea, an astonishing, wonderful campaigner called Pam Warhurst, uh, back uh, now nearly 20 years ago. And she set up Incredible Edible in Todmorden um, 18 years ago. And from there it's grown and grown and grown and grown. And what I was reading on the train was this account of how this little seed of a slightly crazy idea, which is the, one of the ways to connect people locally with food and nature, is actually to have that food growing in people's midst not just stuck away in farms nearby or occasionally in allotments or whatever it might be, but to have it as commonplace and visible and touchable and smellable as you possibly can in the places where people walk and live. And that little seed of an idea has germinated into this extraordinary international movement. And they're about to publish the book of the history of Incredible Edible. And I've just been swept away all over again by the way in which ideas of that kind can seize hold of people's imagination and turn it into something really very special indeed. And the other thing I was looking at, I'm lucky enough to be president of an organization called the Conservation Volunteers. Uh, it used to be called the BTCV, the British Trust for Conservation Volunteers. Uh, went through a rebranding um, 10 years or so ago, and the British bit got dropped, and it's now TCV, the Conservation Volunteers, and I've been president for uh, uh, quite a long time now. And I love the work that TCV does, because it is one of the most immediate ways of connecting people and place and community, very often enabling people who have, for whatever reason it might be, had some difficulty in their life, connecting them with the importance of green spaces to bring green spaces back to life or create new green spaces in a way that simultaneously empowers uh, communities, surrounding communities. It's a brilliant and very, for me, very impactful organization. And I was reading through these award nominations because the TCV heroes will be receiving their Hero Awards at an online ceremony in a couple of weeks' time. And again, you can't help but read this stuff and just get completely swept up in the heroic endeavors of the paid members of staff of TCV and thousands of volunteers. 
The reason I wanted to mention TCB is that right from the start, TCB flagged the critical importance of being in nature from the perspective of human health, both our physical health and our mental health. And TCB was the organization that founded an initiative called Green Gyms, which is a very simple idea, which it might often be more sensible to get people out into nature doing constructive conservation work with other people rather than for their GP to write them another prescription to help with their stress or high blood pressure or depression or whatever it is. And as you know, mental health now is a, is a huge issue for this country, especially in COVID times. And right from the start, TCB said, look, don't just stress the conservation bit, stress what is happening to human health. And what I love about the Friends of Mortimer Forest stuff, when you look at the website, is it's stressing this element of why we should protect places like Mortimer Forest. This beneficial impact on human health is just critically important. You'll be pleased to know for those skeptics amongst you who've always been a bit nervous about the tree-hugging tendencies of certain greenies, you'll be pleased to know that there is rock-solid scientific evidence as to what is going on in the human body when we have the privilege of walking through woodlands and forests. And it's a wonderful thing. I've loved the way that modern Western science has eventually caught up with the kind of innate wisdom of indigenous people and local people going back thousands of years. Now, admittedly, while they were making their charcoal back in the Bronze and Iron Age, I'm sure they weren't all going around thinking about their mental well-being and celebrating the degree to which walking through the woodlands was doing wonderful wonders for their sense of stability and so on and so forth. But the science is amazing, because you probably know that these trees, not just by the way the uh, trees that we all come to love, the hardwoods that we love, but also those exotic trees, those slightly less loved conifers, are all giving off all the time these chemicals of one kind or another, volatile organic compounds such as terpene and so on. And what modern science has told us is that as we breathe this in, so here you are walking through the woods and you're breathing in deeply, I hope, you're breathing in this air shaped by the trees that you're walking through. These chemical compounds enter into our lungs, via our lungs, into our bloodstream, via our bloodstream, into our brains, triggering all sorts of wonderful mechanisms in our brain, including the serotonin receptors, so that, hey presto, the pre and post walk mental health of people is markedly different. Don't you just love that? Good old Western science, eh? Got there eventually. So just next time you're up there in Mortimer Forest or any other woodland or forest nearby, just remember, as you breathe deeply, that this is actually impacting directly on you and needs to be cared and protected in such a way that it can go on having that effect for generations to come. This is the thing we have to hang on to. We don't seem to understand that as well as we might in Japan that has looked after its forests, as anybody will know has been to Japan unbelievably well for centuries and have a very, very different approach to their woodlands and their forest cover. They have a word for this called Shinrin Yoku, and that I have rather inadequately translated into wood air bathing. Well, I haven't, somebody else did, but I obviously nicked the translation um, as the best thing we have. All of these things come together. When we can do these things locally, we're reflecting a whole set of insights and worldviews and perspectives that will serve us well as we come to deal with these big global problems. 
quite honestly, it's been a relief not to have to talk about climate change today. Um, I'm very happy to divert off into whatever climate-related questions you might like to ask me as we go into a Q&A session, because it's really important. But it is difficult when we talk about climate to bring it right down to us in the place where we live, in those natural spaces that have been shared by generations, as you saw from that film. It's difficult to do it with something like climate change. We have brilliant local climate groups, don't get me wrong. Transition towns and Friends of the Earth groups and all sorts of very strong, important local climate campaigners. Um, we even have, by the way, 75% of local authorities in this country who have now acknowledged there is a climate emergency already in full swing but rather fewer of them have as yet to develop an action plan commensurate with that sense of the emergency. So it's not that things aren't going on around climate campaigning locally, they are. But we know perfectly well that those big solutions to climate change will have to be brokered nationally, internationally, through national governments and international UN brokered processes such as the big uh, COP conference in a few weeks' time. We know that that's where those solutions have to be broken. We do need the right laws in this country to get biodiversity and nature conservation right. We need better protections than we have now. We need a much better environmental framework for doing things. But at the same time, there is so much that we can do locally that we need to hang on to that and do it while we still can. So you saw the final strap line on the film, joining up to friends of Mortimer Forest. I'm very much hoping there'll be nobody who leaves this meeting at the end of the day who hasn't got it in mind to do exactly that. Um, I'll probably stop. I heard the church bells going a minute ago, and I thought, hmm, that must be half an hour roughly. Um, so I'll probably stop right now. And we are going to do a Q and a We're going to sort of have a little uh, multimedia moment here where this microphone becomes mobile and I'm turned into a sort of walking, talking weirdo up here with something around my ears. Um, but please do think about what questions you'd like to ask. And honestly, go wherever you want. I'm used to Q&A sessions having a life of their own. So um, over to you. Thank you. Hello, Jonathan. I'm sorry, it's a bit loud. Um, I followed your, uh, I won't call it a career because it's not a career, but uh, I've followed you since the 1980s when you were on television all the time. Do you think that if you'd joined a mainstream political party that you could have achieved more?
Okay. So. Yeah. Technology. Hey. Um, yeah, so I joined the Green Party in 1974, and I am still a member of the Green Party. And obviously the question relates to <laughs> would I have been able to make more of an impact had I joined a, a mainstream political party. And I was obviously thinking about this the other day, as you can imagine, when two colleagues in the Green Party in Scotland joined the government of Scotland as ministers in this government, junior ministers in this government. And that's a, that obviously here in the UK is the closest that the Green Party has ever got to the business of governing. Caroline Lucas, our Green MP for a long time, has been very influential, hugely influential through Parliament, but clearly as a minority party with our insane first-past-the-post electoral system, you can get to be influential, but you can't get to be powerful. So I have thought about this um, from time to time. I don't honestly regret it. I, I really don't regret it, because when I look back to 74, and I look in particular to <laughs> 1979, when I wrote the Green Party Manifesto, in those days, you could sort of get away with that kind of thing. Um, wrote the Green Party Manifesto, and I had reason to visit it recently, which was quite a, quite a moment. And I just thought to myself, okay, this isn't just that the world has moved on, but so many of the ideas in the Green Party in those early days have become very mainstream ideas now. So there are many, many different ways of achieving influence. And I feel that on balance, I've been able to do I hope, um, quite a bit, without becoming uh, a member of, and then a, presumably, a, if I was lucky, an MP for a mainstream party. But thank you for the question. It's a bit late now. <laughs> That's for sure. Well, not they'd ever have me anyway. That was always the other thing. Hello, Jonathan. Uh, I'm shouting. I didn't mean to. Um, I was radicalized by Hilda Murrell, who is an uns un unsung hero living in Shropshire before she was murdered in, in uh, 74, 84. She espoused membership for all the environmental um, uh, organizations in the county, Shropshire Wildlife Trust, CPRE, Council for the Protection of Rural England, etc., etc., plus her fight against nuclear weapons, which is not we're not talking about today. But she came to my husband and me when we had our baby in 63 years ago. She said, Darlings, this is all very well. We were great friends. And she said, I've never had any children, but what you must have is just one more child or no more children because the earth cannot sustain that growth of human beings as we are at the moment. Rachel Carson's Poisoned Earth had just uh, been published in America and I had sat up and realized that that's what was happening to our environmental. I was born up, I brought up on an environmentally run farm, as we would now call it. It was rotation cropping just outside Bridge North, and my grandfather ran it in an old-fashioned day of recycling uh, his methods, which was uh, considered old-fashioned. The people who came in after him would just wipe the floor with that farm. They put basic slag all over it, it was adjacent to a triple SI, which was Thatcher's Wood. All the wildflowers, all the natural substance in that soil was killed at a stroke. Yeah. And that radicalized me enormously. Yeah. No, well, thank you for that reminder. Um, in that list of people who have contributed to the destruction of nature here in the UK. Mark Carwardine included farmers. He didn't go into any great detail, but he included farmers. And I'm sure there are 
many people here today who are either directly or indirectly involved in farming today. This is a time of a food festival, after all. There is a connection. And it's worth reminding ourselves that right now we are beginning to see some pretty interesting, I was about to say dramatic, I'm not sure, but interesting changes in the way in which we now think about managing our farmed land. And I had the privilege on Tuesday last week of visiting a place called NEP, K-N-E-P-P, which is the place where they pioneered a lot of what today is referred to as rewilding, which was an extraordinary experience, I have to admit. Not necessarily the right way to go for everywhere in our farmed landscapes around the UK, very much not the only way to go, but a really important addition around other things such as organic farming and agroforestry and whatever else it might be. We could now see a really smart way of rethinking land use to secure biodiversity outcomes as well as the kind of contribution to food production that we need. We really could. There's no question about that, that we could do that. Um, and I hope we do. The environmental land management payments could be crucial in that. Um, the deeper and more controversial point that you raised, which I will just touch on very briefly, was, of course, population. Uh, people are always a bit nervous about talking about that. It's no good me being nervous about it as president of Population Matters. Um, I've been concerned about population since I joined the Green Party in 1974. I'm still very concerned about it today, and I got deeply, deeply enraged listening to some effete professor on Woman's Hour two days ago who was asked directly, is there any connection between the number of children that we have and climate change? He said, no, not really, no. No, no, that's not, that, it's not a lifestyle thing, this. It's, you know, climate change is something that has to be sorted out by the politicians, and if you're talking about changing things uh, such as flying a bit less or eating a bit less meat or you know, whatever it might be, those are the things you need to focus on, not worrying about the number of children you have. I really get cross about seriously ill-informed, ignorant professors. I don't think they've got any right to be so utterly wrong. Because if you really want to know, since I'm now on this, you will save as much CO2, in fact, you will save 80 times as much CO2 by having one fewer child, children, one less child, one fewer children, than you will save through any combination of wondrous lifestyle changes such as energy efficient life bulb, light bulbs, uh, what did Boris Johnson's advisor suggest the other day? I remember not rinsing your plates before you put them <laughs> in the dishwasher. All that kind of really important stuff by having one less child than you might otherwise be inclined to have. You will save infinitely more CO2 because obviously on your own CO2 footprint at the moment that that extra child, I mean more than two, I'm going to be careful here, <clears throat> uh, more than two, the whole carbon footprint of that new citizen of planet Earth is on your carbon bill. I don't usually say this quite as abruptly as that, but in truth, in the rich world, stop at two, which was always considered to be a pretty radical message, is now beginning to look just a little bit tame. And pretty soon now, if we're going to be able to make space for the numbers of human beings who are still being born onto this world every year, you may find that stop at one becomes a necessary message. That's a bit sobering. But Hilda was always up for those debates. So respect to her at that time, absolutely. Okay, sorry. It's too late, by the way. If you've really got them, it's too late. You, there's nothing you can... And looking around the audience, I don't think, I don't think many of you are making a careful, considered decision <laughs> about whether you're going to have one more or not. I suspect <laughs> that boat may have sailed. <laughs> don't be. <laughs> Thanks. 
and thanks for the, the, what, what you said about in the rich world, the young people should be thinking about having less children. Um, it's really important, isn't it, the, the, uh, the cultural aspects of it. And I was really struck with what you said about, I didn't know that, about Britain being right at the top of membership of conservation organisations, but really near the bottom of, of what we're doing. And I've got a meeting in a couple of weeks with my MP. I'm, I'm not local to here, and congratulations what you're doing here. It's fantastic with Mortimer Forest. But, Jonathan, what advice do you have for me about what I should say to my MP? I want to ask her to support the Climate and Economic Emergency yes. Bill. What shall I say to her? Got it, in one. <laughs> okay, so there's another little bill going through Parliament at the moment, which is the Private Members Bill. So obviously much more vulnerable to parliamentary process and the likelihood of it eventually becoming law is quite small, I have to be honest. But in supporting, um, you didn't mention, is your MP a conservative? She's a conservative. She's a conservative. Yeah. Okay. At the moment, the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill has 120 supporters, MPs, but not one conservative. And that is a... I, that really, that does bug me, I have to admit, because I know lots of conservative-minded, conservative-voting, and even one or two MPs who actually really care about this. And I cannot understand why there'd be an assumption that a conservative MP would care less about the climate and ecological emergency bill and the crises that we face than someone in the Labour Party or the Lib Dems or the Green Party. I just can't see why that would be a a kind of diktat from on high. So encourage her to follow that line. It's a good bill, it's well-crafted, it's not crazy extremist stuff. It's just the, it would just bring the 25-year environment plan right into the deliberations of Parliament today. So instead of this very cynical shoving out of these timelines, for 25, 30, 40 years. It brings all of that stuff right into what we need to do today. Thank Good luck. You. Thank you. I wonder if the Future Generations Bill, the, the Act in, in Wales, can help with, with those deliveries. Yes, actually thinking of the marches, I really should have been more on that one. Thank you. There is a bit of Welsh legislation which is world beating, and everybody interested in this area loves saying that because there aren't necessarily that many, um, but this is the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which became an act in Wales, help me out here, six, six seven years ago, um, was slow to start, now is really impactful. So any new process going through the Welsh Parliament has to explicitly take account of what the consequences of that bill, act if it's passed, will be on future generations. And you can't, you can't avoid that process. You have to think it through, you have to debate it, you have to think about it. So for me, that's a really good process. There is a, a well-being of future generations bill also being raised as a private member's bill in the House of Lords at the moment, um, which would help. That was truly inspirational, thank you very much. I have a question about the transition towards net zero, which is one of these long-term transitions. And my question to you is this, how do we ensure that in that transition to net zero, we do not make the poor poorer and the rich richer? Because much of the legislation and the direction of travel within net zero is actually playing to the hands of big business. There's big business and there's big business. And not all big business is necessarily working against the interests of poorer people or working against the interests of climate stability. And I feel I have to say that because my organization, Forum for the Future, we've been working with some very large companies for more than 20 years. And I have seen close up what an authentic, honest attempt 
to address these issues looks like in some of those companies. But I've also <laughs> experienced exactly the opposite that you are pointing to, which is many big businesses do not care very much about inequality in the world today and don't really care very much about accelerating climate change, although they've certainly got much better at the language messaging that. So as with all of these things, we have to be really sensitive as to how we take this forward. I would not want to rule out the role of big business in helping us arrive at a net zero world. And just to remind you what that means, by the way, because it's a bit relatively new bit of terminology. I was just reflecting on these 75% of local authorities here in the UK who declared a climate emergency. At the time they did that, most of the language was about carbon neutral. And now suddenly in the last two to three years, we've all gone to this new terminology called net zero carbon. And net zero means that the total emissions from a given area, so it could be the global economy, or it could be Ludlow, or it could be your own household, sir, that the net emissions of that unit must reflect two things. One, you reduce your actual emissions of greenhouse gases as far as you possibly can, and then you commit to drawing down as much CO2 as is needed to compensate for the emissions that you're still responsible for at that stage. So net zero. It's very difficult getting to full zero. Really difficult in the short term, if not impossible. Whoa, those kids, eh? Very good. Um, just reminding us what this is all about. So net zero by 2050. They won't be making as much noise as that because unless things are moving on to a very different direction very soon, it's not a happy prospect for 2050, as you know. The reality of it is that we're beginning to understand what this actually looks like now, this journey to get to this ultimate point where we can still, I'm not going to use the word guarantee, but we still have a reasonable prospect of a sufficiently stable climate. Do you see how careful I'm being in my use of words? A reasonable prospect of a sufficiently stable climate that the future of humankind could still be a good one. That's basically what we're hoping for now, our best bet for the future of humankind is a reasonable prospect of a sufficiently stable climate. And the reason for that, as you will know very well, is that we have cumulatively put so much of these greenhouse gases, the CO2 and other gases, into the atmosphere that we've already created a warming effect that will last now for um, a very, very long time indeed. So I'm really resolute in ensuring that we bring social justice into that because there won't be a solution or a set of solutions to that problem if we don't attend to the needs of those who have not been beneficiaries of the last 50 years of breakneck growth-driven development, not only in the rich world, as you know, but in countries like India and China, where there's been huge amounts of uh, new development over the last 20 years. We have to attend to that social justice aspect at the same time. It goes under the terminology of a just transition. And every time you hear people talk about a net zero future, make sure that they include the element of equity, of social justice in what they've got in mind. Starting, by the way, with $100 billion, which the rich world committed to as the transfer, the necessary transfer of resource to poorer and developing and more vulnerable countries to help them cope with the impact of existing climate change on their lives today and to prepare for far greater impacts in the future. And that was signed up to, well, actually seven years ago and then confirmed at Paris in 2015. Transfers so far? Phew, dear, oh dear. I must stop throwing out these rhetorical challenges because you can pretty much guess it doesn't resembling anything like 100 billion a year, just in case you're in any confusion about that. Yes, 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 sorry, I'm just being told that we've got to go and quieten down those kids. Jonathan, hello uh, again after all these years. Alistair hello, again. nice to see yes. you. I, was, um, uh, I didn't put my glasses I'm on. I'm going to try and combine two questions in one if I may. 
Extinction Rebellion, I've got a lot of time for a lot of what they do, I think a lot of it is so positive, but I struggle with giving up meat, which is one of their main things. I cut down as much as I can, but when we're being told not to eat many, any meat at all, what are the statistics or the, the, what's the theory, do you think, if the meat industry was completely lost, surely the farmland would just be built on? Would the loss of the industry actually be a good thing or would it be a bad thing? And secondly, when I see the Extinction Rebellion protesters sharing everything on social media, surely one of the greatest threats and biggest producers of emissions I've read, I may be wrong, is data storage. So would you be able to answer those two questions? Is the loss of the meat industry necessarily going to be beneficial? And is data storage a hidden ticking time bomb? I love it when the person facilitating your meeting goes like this, you know. <laughs> time to stop. Let's just have one more question, and then you have one more question. And of course, it's a question which cannot be answered easily in quite a short a period of time, as I suspect uh, you would like, Robert. I'm sorry about that. Um, but Alistair, thank you. And by the way, uh, if I may, thank you for all your years of support for environmental causes, which has been enormously um, important. It's been fantastic. Um, let me answer the second one first. Yes. So. The, the, the massive increase in our digital lives, uh, in every way, both with more conventional devices and all the social media stuff, has, has rapidly and very, very dramatically increased the total amount of energy required to drive that digital universe, particularly storage, where even though most of it, or a lot of it now, has migrated to the cloud, don't imagine that just because it's in the cloud, as it were, that it isn't still demanding, making a demand in terms of the energy required. There is a technical solution to that, and the technical solution is that we move, of course, to renewable electricity for everything, not just for energy generation, for transport, for certain uh, other industries, but we will need to move to 100% renewable electricity for all of our digital dependencies. And to be fair to a group of companies that I otherwise utterly despise, uh, namely Google, Apple, and all those other shockers, um, to be fair to them, they are moving faster to 100% renewable electricity than any other sector in the world. So there is a bit of a way out there. I won't go any further on that one. The second one on meat eating, I know. The second one because you're about to be ushered out, by the way, <laughs> to make a choice. And as I understand it, your difficult choice will be, are you going to have a venison sausage, or are you going to have a vegan sausage? And I'm a bit worried that my answer to this question may influence the choice that you make. <laughs> and you may run out, therefore, of one or the other. Um, look, for me, this is actually more simple than most people think that it is. I'm not a vegan. I'm not a vegetarian. I'm a massive supporter of the eat, brackets, a lot, close brackets, less meat, which is the line taken by an organization I am very proud to be associated with as a patron, Compassion and World Farming which has argued brilliantly for decades now to get rid of all factory farming, to just put an end to the horror story inflicted on 17 billion animals. It's almost impossible to imagine this. 17 billion animals around the world. To get rid of that truly repugnant uh, exercise of cruelty over other living creatures. And that's the line I take. And when I went to NEP, which I mentioned, so I'll throw this in, as some of you may know about NEP, NEP has lots of wondrous-looking livestock wandering around, doing brilliant things in this rewilded environment. So the Tamworth pigs, for instance, just gorgeous. The longhorn cattle, the venison. Oh, you know, you think, actually, what is wrong with that? If these animals are being cared for properly, being slaughtered responsibly, with no cruelty and complete freedom, then 
I don't personally have a problem about that. I know that there are a lot of people who still have a huge problem with that and genuinely want to see the elimination of any animal-based protein, not just terrestrial animals, but mar marine protein as well, as you know, all the fish that we eat. I don't, I don't share that position. And when I think about the future of farming in the UK, I seriously hope that it will continue to include the right kind of use of livestock in integrated mixed farming systems with the priority on agroforestry and biodiversity and organic systems of cultivation. Because for me, that is compatible with a genuinely sustainable use of our land. Um, but we will, Anastasia, we will go on having these moral dilemmas and discussions <laughs> for a very long time to come. I suspect that's just where I've settled. I'm reluctant to say that's where anybody else would settle, but hey, venison, gosh, you need to control those little blighters. That's all I can say. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Robert Owen, and I'm one of the trustees of the Friends of Mortimer Forest, and I'm here to say a very, very warm thank you to Sir Jonathan for an absolutely brilliant and challenging and inspiring address for us as members of the Friends of Mortimer Forest, because fighting against the collapse of biodiversity is right at the center of what we're all about. And that was, it is certainly not as high on the political agenda as it deserves to be. I mean, climate change is creeping up there now, it's getting more attention, but the biodiv biodiversity emergency is still right down there. Uh, and I think everyone probably here feels the same, and that, as I say, is absolutely central to our endeavors uh, in this new charity. Um, I was also, in that context, I think it's worth mentioning, we talked about different parties and all the rest of it, that uh, it so happens that your local MP here in Ludlow is the chairman of the Environmental Audit Committee, uh, which you uh, mentioned, Philip Dunn, uh, who is also a very strong supporter of uh, more, uh, the Friends of Mortimer Forest, so, and we are, enjoy a lot of um, support from him as well. I was particularly happy at your mention of mental health as well, because that is another big aspect of what we are trying to do uh, as the Friends, uh, develop activities which will enable people with different kinds of disability, particularly mental disability, uh, to benefit from the uh, therapeutic effects of the forest, which we all agree with. So thank you again for an absolutely brilliant speech, from a, not only from a UK point of view, but from a, from a global point of view. I'd like to thank the questioners too. Uh, some very good questions there, and I uh, think that enhanced the event considerably. So, and thank you also to Roddy Swire for presiding over the proceedings so effectively. And can I also say thank you to Sir Neil Cossens, who is with us here, who is another of our patrons, uh, our distinguished patrons. And also a strong supporter uh, in the form of Sebastian Bowen, who is also there, who is the chair of Herefordshire Council. Um, and I would also mention, if I may, um, Colin Richards, who is our chairman, as the uh, chairman of the Friends of the Mortimer Forest, um, who, for whom I am standing in, um, uh, who was all set to be here and would be speaking instead of me if he had not been diverted by a particularly crucial family event. That you saw him, uh, which, which took, came off at short notice. 
and you saw him in the film, however, and he is uh, deeply involved and has played a crucial part in getting us to where we are now. And a special vote of thanks also uh, to Kelvin Price, the rector of Ludlow, for allowing us to use this spectacular building. Um, and, and to Peter Neild, who you saw earlier, who was played with his colleagues um, from St. Lawrence's, an enormously important part in all these arrangements, which have included, um, as I think he mentioned, getting the event recorded, and it will be available on the websites of both St. Lawrence's and um, the Friends of Mortimer Forest. So please tell your friends if they wanted to be here but weren't able to, that they can uh, experience the event uh, retrospectively in their sitting rooms, although they will have missed out on, on the sausages, I'm afraid. Uh, also, uh, the event will be on YouTube for a period of about uh, four weeks, I believe. Well, our membership has grown very rapidly in a very short space of time, uh, and I'm sure it will receive a further boost from today's event, which will be the first of many. Um, and I'd just like to uh, put in the, another plug for every, anybody who uh, would like to be a member, please, there is a form on your seats and you can fill it in and leave it here or you can go back home and you can, via our website or our Facebook page, you can also join. And that will make it easier for us to keep you abreast of the events which we are organizing as we go forward. And these will include um, some guided walks uh, in partnership with Forestry England, with whom we hope to establish a mutually beneficial working relationship on a number of fronts, including habitat enhancement projects, uh, facilities and activities for people with different kinds of disabilities, and also educational activities for children as well as adults. And I'm very happy to see representatives of Forestry England here today, uh, and I'm also happy to see some senior representatives of uh, like-minded charities, including the Wildlife Trusts, uh, with whom we also plan to work and whose experience and knowledge, which is much greater than ours, will be of enormous benefit. So thank you also to Helen Stace and Richard Grindle, the chief executives of the two wildlife trusts, Herefordshire and Shropshire, for coming and being with us. The first three of our guided walks I'd just like to mention. The first is going to be on October the 13th, and it will be led by Alan Reid, uh, the wildlife ranger for this part of the world from Forestry England, who is also here today, and who will be uh, explaining the deer management uh, of Mortimer Forest and hopefully you will have a chance to see some fine specimens of deer. It will be in the middle of the uh, rutting season, I'm happy to say. And then the second event uh, is going to be on December the 13th, and that will be led by Lynn Daly from Forestry England, the community ranger, and that will be talking about tree identification. And then Colin, our chairman, will be organizing another uh, uh, guided walk later in December which will be on the history of the landscape and how to interpret it. And next spring, we plan to have a festival of the forest, uh, also in co cooperation with Forestry England, with a variety of activities, including demonstrations of uh, historic and contemporary woodland crafts, um, and woodland art and music, and food from the forest, and tree planting and other activities. The date will be uh, announced on our website in due course. It'll probably be in May. Some of our future activities are likely to involve uh, volunteering, so I hope a few of you and our other members uh, will feel minded to come and spend a day or two in the forest um, with uh, like-minded people uh, on undertaking conservation-related activities. 
I can assure you that they, we, shall, we shall make them fun for all concerned. So the way, we are at the start of a, an exciting journey, uh, and I hope to see many of you uh, as we move forward with our plans. Um, it is and now, uh, there is, I believe, there are, I believe, a number of sausages and still left. Uh, by the way, I, sh I should uh, assure you that venison is the most uh, sustainable meat you could possibly eat. And you're actually doing us a favor, because to be truthful, we've got rather too many of them <laughs> in, in Mortimer Forest. So please come and eat some sausages and enjoy a bit of wine. Finally, before I, lay, uh, uh, I finish, I'd just like to, to mention one other thing, which is not directly related, but uh, if you don't know, uh, there is the pilgrimage for the planet, uh, which is taking place uh, leading up to the COP um, uh, conference in Glasgow, and the, the marches will be starting from Le uh, Castle Square in Ludlow on the 15th, which is sometime next week. So if you didn't know about that already, uh, look to their website. And I think Pamela is here, and she will... Do you want to stand up, Pamela, and just let everyone know who you are? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, lovely. Okay. Thank you all. Sorry. Okay, there's your final message. Thank you all very much.